But it's working. The pointer. Oh, it is. Oh, okay. That your person. Oh, okay. Well, is it there in the, I will see if it's there in the same code. Some other pair, no? How about the number? Okay, I think that to ignore it. We, I don't know, we have one minute left. Oh, yes. It's obvious. Well, it's 11. And now it's 11. Yeah. That's pretty great. Okay. So, for today, for our analysis seminar, it's a pleasure for me to introduce uh, Miguel Urbano from Caos, Saudi Arabia. He will talk to, uh, today about the uh, leaches learning and infinitely infinite la plata. So, thank you. Okay. Thank you, Christian. Let me start by thanking uh, Christian, Damiao, and uh, Emmanuel for the invitation to visit ICTP. It's been a wonderful week here in a place that reminds me a lot of the uh, IMPA, of which I have very fond memories. I visited IMPA for the first time 20 years ago, and uh, this is my first time here in ICTP. So thanks very much for the week and for the invitation to deliver this talk. Um, I've been working for some years on uh, singular and degenerate PDEs, and uh, I've been finding uh, different applications uh, of these uh, equations in different areas. And today I want to talk about uh, an application in machine learning that I recently came across, and I think it's quite interesting. Um, so I wanna say a little bit, what is the, the Lipschitz learning problem? And then uh, uh, I want to talk about the infinity Laplace equation and some of its properties and um, how we can use hard analysis to solve very contemporary problems in machine learning. So, a big problem in machine learning is the problem of labeled data. So, if you deal with the large amounts of data, uh, you need, in, in several situations, you need to label this data. For example, think about uh, uh, medical images. If you have uh, large amounts of me medical images, you want to know if each of these images corresponds to uh, a situation of concern, or if the image corresponds to a healthy scenario in which you don't have to do anything. And of course, if you have to pay a medical doctor to go and see all the images and label them as healthy or unhealthy, this is going to be very, very expensive. So if you can, in some way, use just a few labeled data, and then somehow explore the structure of the unlabeled data to learn a function that somehow extends the labeled data to the unlabeled data, then uh, you have a great advantage, right? Another example is classification of website visits. So companies want to know which advertisements they should use to target. So for example, now I'm interested in buying a bicycle. So I'm visiting a lot of websites that sell bikes 
and sites with information about bicycles. So if there is an automatic way of knowing which sites I am visiting, then these companies can target me with advertising corresponding to my current interests. Again, if they have to pay someone to do this labeling, say by hand, this is going to be very expensive. So the idea here is, and this is what's, what's the object of semi so-called semi-supervised learning, you use very few label data, and then you explore the structure of the much larger set of unlabeled data to somehow extend the information from the labeled to the unlabeled data. Okay. Of course, doing this, the, the, the way I just described the problem, the problem is extremely opposed because there are many ways of doing this extension. Okay. So, in order to hope to have some sort of uniqueness, you have to introduce what's called a smoothness assumption. So, you have to do this assuming that uh, this uh, unlabeled data changes smoothly in these regions. Uh, of the graph, because what, what people do is that they give this data set, the structure of a graph. So each data point becomes a vertex, and then edges correspond to some sort of measure of proximity between the, the data points. Okay. Um, so this smoothness assumption is implemented in practice by uh, minimizing a certain uh, quantity or in the continuous case, a certain function. So the first thing that people thought was to, so here is just a picture. So the idea that the data set has the structure of a graph. And so the, the first attempt is to use the so-called Laplacian regularization, okay? So what you want to do is this. So you want to, you are given a function G, say on, this is the set of label data that you know. Okay, so this is the boundary of some set. So you want to find U, which coincides with G on this set, but is defined in a much larger set X. And you want to extend G to, the set X, minimizing this quantity. Okay, so here you have the square of the distance. This is the weight that measures the, the similarity between the points. So typically you can think of this, if X and Y are close, this is one, if they are far apart, this is basically zero. Now, if you pass to the continuous limit, basically what you are doing is minimizing the Dirichlet energy, so the auto norm of the gradient, and we know that minimizers of this functional are harmonic functions. They solve Laplace equation. Okay. So this is a, a way of uh, uh, trying to solve the problem. But what people realize uh, is that in this case, when you have very few labeled data, so you have very few information on the boundary, then this minimization problem leads to a sort of degenerate solution. So the solution somehow becomes constant, a sort of average of the labels, okay? And then the labels are attained in a discontinued fashion. So they jump, uh, the function jumps to attain the, the boundary data. So if you are familiar with the, the language of solar spaces and so on, what's happening here is that you are solving a problem uh, finding a solution. So a minimizer lives in H1, the solar space W12. And uh, since we are dealing normally with functions that live in spaces of very high dimension, then functions in W12 will not be continuous up to the boundary. So they will be discontinuous, right? And that's why you observe this sort of phenomenon. So people started thinking of instead of using two, using a much larger power here in the minimization function, right? So if you put here a P, a very large P, what you're doing is that in the minimization process, you are discouraging the choice of functions that change a lot. Because if you have here 
if this difference is large, then this to the power p is going to be a huge number. So you're not going to choose this function. Okay. So you are imposing a much better smoothness effect. Now, again, if p if p is very large, in particular, if p becomes larger than dimension, then in the continuous scenario, what you are doing, in fact, you are minimizing the LP norm of the gradient. Your solutions will be solutions of the so-called P Laplace equation, and they live in the space W1P. And if P is very large, it's going to be larger than dimension. And then we know that by Sobolev embedding, in fact, functions in W1P are holder continuous up to the boundary. And so the boundary data are attained in a continuous fa fashion. And so this is what's observed in practice here. The graph is a much smoother uh, surface and the boundary data are attained in a, a smoother way. Now you think for dimensions that are increasingly higher, I have to take P larger and larger. So why not take P equal to infinity? And then you would have P greater than dimension for any dimension. And this is exactly what happens in the context of the so-called Lipschitz learning. So instead of the LP norm of the gradient, you take the, you minimize the L infinity norm of the gradient here. So you replace this sum by the maximum, so in the continuum case, you're minimizing the L infinity norm of the gradient, which we can say is the Lipschitz constant of the function, because for convex domains, these two things are the same, the L infinity norm of the gradient and the Lipschitz constant. And then your minimizers will be solutions of the so-called infinity Laplace equation. I will say in a while what, what this is, okay? But now the problem, the Lipschitz learning problem is this. You are given a function which is Lipschitz on the boundary of a domain. Okay, you can you can think about this, this gamma here as being the boundary of a domain omega. And what you want to do is you want to extend this function, this Lipschitz function defined on the boundary to the interior of the domain, but you want to minimize the Lipschitz constant. So since, of course, you cannot decrease the Lipschitz constant, the best thing you can, you can do is to keep it the same. Okay, so this is the problem in, in Lipschitz learning. In analytical terms, this is what you have to do. You are given a function on the boundary of a set. This is your label data. And you want to extend it to the interior of the set, to the unlabeled data that you have, which is much larger, a much larger set. And you want to do this without increasing the Lipschitz constant. So this is the Lipschitz extension problem, which is quite well known in analysis for uh, more than 100 years. Okay. So this is what this is what you have to do. Can we solve this problem? Perhaps we can. Perhaps we're going to solve it in the next 10 minutes. But before we do that, let me show you what happens in the case of Lipschitz learning. So you get indeed a much smoother surface and the boundary data is attained in a much smoother function. And what is the infinity Laplace equation? So the infinity Laplace is this highly degenerate nonlinear operator in non-divergence form. So you have this combination of first order and second order derivatives. Then we call it infinity Laplace. So you would expect that this appears as some sort of limit when P goes to infinity in the P Laplace equation. And that's indeed the case. Let me show you how, how we do this in a sort of a heuristic uh, type of way. So the, the P Laplace equation is this. So you have the divergence of gradient U to the power P minus two, gradient U equals zero. So if P is two, of course, this is one, and you just get the divergence of the gradient, which is the Laplacian. So you get Laplace equation. Now let's uh, take the divergence inside. And what we get is this. So we get EU, E minus two, divergence of the gradient, which is the Laplacian. And then we take the gradient of this inner product, this. 
Okay, so when we take the gradient of this, we get the exponent p minus two. Then the exponent to the power p minus two minus one, which is p minus three. And then we have to take the gradient of this, this uh, the modulus of the gradient. So you get du divided by the modulus of u, and then you have the hat here, right? And then inner product du equals zero. So this is what we get. Okay, now I'm going to put this guy over there. So here I put a four equals zero. And now I'm going to divide by this, okay? Because I have this equal to zero. I divide by this. So P minus two divided by P minus four, I get here square, okay? I get here square. And then I divide everything by P. So if I divide by P, I get here one over P. And here I get, one minus two over p. Now I pass p to infinity. So this does not depend on p. When p goes to infinity, this disappears. This goes to one, and I'm left with this, which is in fact the infinity of loss of the view equals. Okay. Of course, this should be written like this. So it's the Haskell multiplied by the gradient. This is a vector inner product of the gradient, that's precisely the infinity of plus. So the infinity of plus, in fact, is obtained from the pillar plus when p goes to infinity. Of course, this has to be properly justified, but for that, you need to use the, the language of viscosity solutions, okay? Because that's the way to interpret uh, in, the, in the right way what is the solution of the infinity of plus equation. You see that the equation is not in divergence form, so we cannot integrate by parts, by after multiplying by a test function. So to understand this equation, we have to use the language of viscosity solutions. I'll do that in a little while. So, but now I want to go back to the, to the Lipschitz extension problem, okay? So let's just fix some notation. So we're gonna call, we're gonna say that uh, F is Lipschitz. We're gonna use this notation. Right? This means that F is Lipschitz on the set X, and the, the smallest of the Lipschitz constants, we're going to call it uh, lip of F in X, okay? So this is going to be the, the least constant L for which the Lipschitz condition is satisfied, okay? So we're going to denote it by lip F in X. So what is our problem? Our problem is this. Given a function f, Lipschitz on the boundary of a domain, we want to find a function u, which is Lipschitz on the closure of the domain, such that we have an extension. So u extends f, so they coincide on the boundary. And the Lipschitz constant of u on the closure of u is exactly the Lipschitz constant of f on the boundary. So you extend the function, but you keep the Lipschitz constant the same. You do not increase the Lipschitz constant, All right? So this is the Lipschitz extension problem. This is what you want to do when you do Lipschitz level. Okay? Let's look at an example because examples are always uh, instructive. Let's look at a very simple example. So let's take our domain U to be this union of two intervals, zero, one. And let's take F. So the boundary of U, the boundary of U is in this case a set with three points, minus one, zero, and one. And let's take F divide, defined on the boundary to be this function. So function that minus one and zero, f is zero, and f of one is one. So we have this. We have the integral minus one, one. Here f is zero, here f is zero, and here f is one, okay? 
we have this function f defined in this sequence. Of course, you have these Lipschitz. What's the Lipschitz constant of f? So one is lip of f on the boundary of u. Well, you just have to compute all the all the quotients, and you immediately see that the Lipschitz constant is going to be one, right? It's f of one minus f of zero divided by one minus zero. This is the largest one, right? Because I mean, if you go this minus this, you get one minus zero divided by two, which is one half, and with this two, you get zero. Okay, so the largest quotient is one. So this is the Lipschitz constant. So what do we want to do? We want to find a function defined in the closure that goes through these three points and which has a derivative that does not exceed one. Okay. So the slope cannot be larger than. So we have to connect these three points without increasing the, the slope, which is one, right? And this is not a very difficult problem. Everyone can do this, okay? Um, but maybe if I ask you to do it, different people will do different things, okay? Because there, there is more than one solution. The problem is not uniquely solved. Solved, right? Now, let's think of the problem. Let's, let's now try to go from the example to the general case. Let's try to solve it. So how can we think about this? So let's take a, a, a point Z on the boundary of U. Now in general, forget the example. And if I construct this function, F of Z minus the Lipschitz constant of F on the boundary of U, x minus z, this function of x for z fixed on the boundary, this is going to be always less or equal than a solution. If u is a solution of the problem, this is going to be true always. Why? Just do this. Bring this u to the left-hand side and this to the right-hand side. So this becomes so this is equivalent to what I'm going to write here. Less or equal the Lipschitz constant of f, d of u, x minus z. Now, if I'm solving the problem, you see that f of z, z is on the boundary, f on the boundary coincides with u. So here I can put u. And if I have a solution of the problem, the Lipschitz constant does not increase. So the Lipschitz constant of f on the boundary is exactly the same if I have a solution as the Lipschitz constant of u on the closure. And now this is obviously true, okay? Because I have this, this difference is less or equal than the modulus. And this is the net definition of being Lipschitz, right? If u is Lipschitz, then u of z minus u of x is going to be less or equal than a Lipschitz constant, x minus z. Okay? So this is obviously true. So this holds always whenever I choose a point z on the bottom. And now this function here is, of course, so this is a constant minus a constant times this uh, this, the modules of this difference. This is a cone function. But this is, of course, the Lipschitz function. And of course, this leap of f on the boundary is going to be a Lipschitz constant for this function. Okay, this is obvious. This is going to, to be a Lipschitz constant for this function. And you see that this Lipschitz constant does not depend on z. So if, I, if z varies on the boundary, I'm going to have a family of Lipschitz functions with the same Lipschitz constant. And if I have a family of functions with the same Lipschitz constant, then if I take the supremum of these functions, I'm going to get a Lipschitz function with the same Lipschitz constant. So here I can take now the supremum 
when z belongs to the boundary of u, sorry, of all these guys. And this is going to be a Lipschitz function, and it has this as Lipschitz function. And this is going to be a Lipschitz function in the closure of u, which has this as Lipschitz constant. So the Lipschitz constant this did not increase. Now, if this is, if this coincides with f on the boundary, then we, we, we solve the problem. Because this will be a solution to the Lipschitz extension in fact right and in fact this function is soup coincides with f on the bottom okay why because you see that if x belongs to the boundary of u this is less or equal than um f of x this is obvious, right? Because again, this is just the definition of being Lipschitz. You do exactly the same as I did before. You bring this to the other side, this comes here. And of course, since the two points are on the boundary, this is the Lipschitz constant of f on the boundary. This is just the definition of Lipschitz. So if x is on the boundary, all these guys are below f. So if I take the supremum, this is going to be less or equal than f. Okay? So this soup is going to be less or equal than f. But it's also going to be greater or equal than f, because here, if x is on the boundary, I can take x equal to x, z equals to x, and here what do I get inside? If z equals to x, this is real, I just get f of x. Okay? So, on the boundary, this guy here, which is what we call mw subs f of x, this function, this function, this soup, the supremum of these cones coincides with f on the boundary. So this is an extension of f to the interior. And it's a Lipschitz constant with the same Lipschitz constant of f on the boundary. So this is, in fact, the solution to the Lipschitz extension. It's what we call the McShane Whitney extension. And it's a solution to the problem. And of course, if I take y on the boundary and I consider here plus, and then I consider the infimum of those guys, I'll get that I'll get another solution with which is the McShane Whitney extension, upper extension of f on. And so any other solution of the problem must be between these two, these two much with the extensions, okay? Now, the thing is that these two guys rarely coincide, and so the problem is not uniquely solved. Let's see what this is in our example, okay? So let's, uh, let's see what happens in our example. So we have to, we must take the supremum, between, in this case, so the boundary has three points. So we have to take the soup between three functions, three cones. Okay, it's going to be the soup. So first, z minus one. Okay, so we get f of minus one, which is zero, minus the Lipschitz constant, which is one, x minus minus one. So we get minus x plus one. Right? This is the first one. Then, when z is zero, we get f of zero, which is zero, minus one x minus zero. So we get minus modules of x. And the third one, when z is one, we get f of one minus x minus one. All right? So let's build it here. So what is this function? x plus one, the modules of this minus. So this is gonna be this cone, right? Minus this is gonna be this cone. 
And this one, one minus X minus one. So you see that the, the vertex of the cone is going to be in one, right? The cone is facing down. So you get exactly this cone. Okay. And now you want to take the soup of these guys. Okay. So you see, you don't care what happens to the right of this thing, okay? To the left of this or to the right of this, this you don't care. So what's the soup? The soup is going to be this function here, okay? Let's build the machine with an extension, the lower machine with an extension. So you see, in fact, we have connected these three points and we didn't increase the Lipschitz constant because the slope here is one, or the modules of the slope is one, and here is one. Now, the upper machine with an extension is going to be, now we think about it, it's going to be this function. Okay, and the others must be so here they have to coincide with the identity. There's no other possibility, but here they are between these two, these two cones. Okay, so in fact there are many solutions. So another solution would be this. This would be another solution, and so on. Right. So. We can solve the Lipschitz extension problem, but the solution is not the one we want because we have no uniqueness. And this is not good, right? The problem is still extremely imposed. So we only have uniqueness when these two McShane Whitney extensions coincide, right? And this, as we've seen by a simple example, can well not happen. So this is what I wrote in the next slide. So the McShane Whitney extensions are these functions here that we just defined and uh, we solve the problem right so the machine with the extensions solve the Lipschitz extension problem for f and any other solution must be between these two so in fact we solve the problem but we don't have units and this is not good so how can we find a way to solve this problem and have some sort of uniqueness. So we have to ask for something else in order to have uniqueness, okay? And what we're going to ask is that this property is solved also local. Think about this. If you are minimizing the L2 norm of the gradients in a domain omega, and you find a minimizer, if you go to a domain which is inside, strictly inside omega, your solution will be a minimizer in this domain. So in fact, when you're minimizing the L2 normal or the LP norm of the gradient, your minimizers have this kind of local uh, property. So if you go inside to a domain, there are still minimizers to the problem inside. But here, this doesn't happen. So think about this solution. For example, this one, the upper McShane Whitney extension. So if I go, I'm, so this, this is a solution to the problem in this domain. But suppose I consider here a subdomain of the original domain. Now, if I look at the value of the function on the boundary, these two will coincide. So the Lipschitz constant on the boundary here is going to be zero because you just have two points and they are the same. But when you go inside the domain, you increase the Lipschitz constant because the Lipschitz constant is one. So your solution in the domain U, when you go to a subdomain V, is no longer a solution to the problem. Because if you look at the Lipschitz constant on the boundary of this domain, then the solution going to the interior will increase the Lipschitz constant. So it doesn't solve the same problem inside. So locality is not a, a property in this case. So, Maybe the key 
to obtain uniqueness is to somehow impose this notion of locality. So you are going to ask that your solution to the Lipschitz extension problem satisfies this local problem. And you see in our example, the only function of all the possible extensions that satisfies this property locally is the one that probably you thought about when I, when I put the problem. Exactly, is to go like this, is this one, right? Then you connect this point to this point like this with derivative zero, and then you go up. And in fact, for this one, if you go inside the domain, the same problem is solved by this function. And this is in fact unique. So that's the way to, to solve the problem, is to ask for not the Lipschitz extension, but what we call an absolutely minimizing Lipschitz extension. We abbreviate this to Amway. What is an absolutely minimizing Lipschitz extension on a domain U? It's a continuous function that solves this problem at every level, say, right? For every V strictly contained in U, when you go from the boundary to the interior, the Lipschitz constant does not increase. Okay? And we can recast our original problem in the following form. Even F Lipschitz on the boundary, we want to find a continuous function on the closure of U that extends F, so it's still an extension, but which is absolutely minimizing Lipschitz. So it, it not only solves the Lipschitz extension problem, but it solves it at every scale. So for every subset V of U, this function is such that the Lipschitz constant going from the boundary to the interior does not increase, okay? And this is the right way to solve uh, the Lipschitz extension problem. This is the right way to approach Lipschitz, Lipschitz learning. Now, magic happens. This guy, the solution of this problem, the extension, which is absolutely minimizing Lipschitz, is precisely the viscosity solution, the unique viscosity solution of the infinity Laplace equation corresponding to this boundary then. Okay? So solving the Lipschitz extension problem in the right way in order to get uniqueness is in fact the same thing as solving the PDE in the viscosity sense with this boundary then. Okay? So these notions are equivalent. And there's another more geometric type of notion, which is called comparison with cones, that is equivalent to these two things, to being absolutely minimizing Lipschitz or to being a viscosity solution of the infinity Laplace equation. And so cones have appeared here, right? So these functions, so the, the family of functions here, they are all cones. And so a cone is what you expect is a function of this of this type. So you have a constant plus another constant modules of x minus x zero. x zero is the vertex of the cone. A is the height of the cone and B is the opening of the cone or the slope of the function, the cone function. And we say that a function enjoys comparison with cones from above. If this thing happens for every V strictly contained in U and every cone whose vertex is not in V, if U or if W is below the cone on the boundary of V, then it's going to be below the cone in V. So this is comparison with comes from above. And of course, comparison with comes from below is exactly what you expect, right? If, if, if the function is above the cone on the boundary, then it's going to be above the cone also in the interior. And you, a function enjoys comparison with cones. If it enjoys comparison with cones from above and from below, okay? So these are some kind of dual uh, definitions that will be uh, connected to the notion of sub-solution, viscosity sub-solution and viscosity uh, super-solution. So viscosity sub-solutions enjoy comparison with comes from below, viscosity super-solutions enjoy comparison with comes from above, okay? So what we can show is that 
in joint comparison with cones and being absolutely minimizing Lipschitz are the same thing. So a function, a continuous function, is absolutely minimizing Lipschitz if and only if it enjoys comparison with cones. Okay. And let me just show you uh, the sufficiency of this condition, right? Let me just show you that if you enjoy comparison with cones, then U is absolutely minimizing Lipschitz because it's a very, I think it's a very nice rule. So let's suppose that U enjoys comparison with cones and let's take any V strictly contained in U. So what we want to show is that the Lipschitz constant of the function U remains the same when we go from the boundary to the interior, okay? Now, of course, if V is strictly contained in U and, and the function V and the function U is continuous in U, it's going to be continuous up to the boundary of V because the boundary of V is strictly contained in U. And so it's an exercise to show that the Lipschitz constant of U in V coincides with the Lipschitz constant of you on the boundary, on the closure, okay? So since this is contained here, of course, we're gonna have trivially that this is greater or equal. And so what we need to do is to put the other in the So this is the, the only thing that we need to do. Now, let's first observe that for any X in V, this uh, equality holds. So if I, if, I, if I try to compute the Lipschitz constant of U, on the boundary of V from which I remove the point X, then you see the boundary of this set is going to be the boundary of V plus the point X, right? So let's show that this the Lipschitz constant here is the Lipschitz constant in V. Right? So when I add a point to the boundary of V, the Lipschitz constant does not change. Okay. So to see that this is true, the only thing we have to prove is that u of y minus u of x is less or equal than the Lipschitz constant on the boundary, this thing, y minus x, right? For any y on the boundary. So I just added this point x. So if I compare it with every point on the boundary and this Lipschitz constant will do this, then I don't increase the Lipschitz constant, of course. That's for, for all the other points that the, this will work as Lipschitz constant. And this is equivalent by removing the modulus to these two inequalities, right? Now, these things here, this really holds for X on the boundary, right? Because if X is on the boundary, then it's the same thing that we did here, right? So if X is on the boundary, then U of X minus U of Y is of course less, less, less or equal than the Lipschitz constant the view on the boundary X minus Y. This is the definition of Lipschitz. But what we want to prove is that it holds for X in V, not on the boundary, okay? So let's focus on this, on the second. On this one, for the right to be the same, for, for this inequality to be the same. So let's focus on this thing. Now look at the right hand side. What is this function? So this is a function of x, right? So u is fixed. Y is fixed here. Okay? So this is what we call this function of x here, this right hand side. This is exactly a cone. So it's a constant plus a constant x minus one. It's a cone with vertex in y. Right? Centered at y, which is a point on the boundary of v, right? So y is a point on the boundary of v. So the vertex is not in v. So y is on the boundary of v, it's not in v, and you enjoy comparison, it comes from above because it enjoys comparison, it comes. So the inequality holds in v because it holds on the boundary, okay? So this on the boundary, this clearly holds on the boundary of v. This is a cone. What's comparison with cones? If we have a cone with a vertex which is not in V, which is the case because the vertex is in on the boundary of V, which is different from V, then if U is below the cone on the boundary, and it is below the cone on the boundary, because I mean this is just the Lipschitz condition on the boundary, then this is in fact is going to hold also in V. Because of comparison with cones, which is our assumption. Okay. So that's just what we do. We use comparison with cones to prove this and to obtain the first inequality, the, the, the reasoning is the same. Okay. So now take, take two points. 
and we use this property twice, right? So the Lipschitz constant of u here is the same as the Lipschitz constant on the boundary of V. You remove this point, and then you apply the same thing, you remove another point. Now, then you remove y, okay? And since x and y belong to the boundary of V minus this, because this is the boundary of the union, these two points, we have precisely this thing, and we prove what we want. Okay, so this is how comparison with cones is used to prove that U is absolutely minimizing Lipschitz. The, the reciprocal is a bit more challenging, but we can we can prove it easily. And now let's talk about viscosity solutions. So the right way to interpret the infinity Laplace equation is to uh, introduce the notion of viscosity solution. So what is a viscosity solution of the, of the PDE for those of you less familiar with this uh, terminology? So we say that the, a, a continuous function, so the idea is that, you see, the, the PDE involves derivatives of first order and second order, but we would like to have solutions that have, may have no derivatives at all. So a solution of the infinity Laplace equation could be merely a continuous function, okay? So what you do is that you're going to ask some kind of test function to satisfy something involving the derivatives, and the idea is this. So a viscosity subsolution of the equation is a function, a continuous function such that for every point in U, if you touch this point from above by a C2 function phi, then this C2 function must solve the PDE pointwise at that point. Well, not the PDE, but this inequality. Now, you see that if the function is C2, then you can compute the infinity of Laplacian of the function because all the derivatives now exist in the classical sense. So you compute this combination of derivatives at the point X hat, and this must be greater or equal than C now. Okay? So, and you have a viscosity subsolution if this happens for every point and every C2 function that touches. The function from above at that point. Okay. Uh, so this has a maximum. Yeah. So w is going to be always less or equal than five. Okay. And uh, a viscosity super, super solution is the same thing. You touch from below and you ask the the the, the touching C two function to satisfy the equation in the in the classical sense at that point, or the inequality in the classical sense. So, of course, I mean, we can we can define any notion of solution that we would like to. I mean, we are free to do this, right? In particular, uh, I mean, we take this to the extreme, we can say that the solution to, to the PDE is, uh, I mean, whatever, it's zero, for example, right? But the idea here is that you extend the notion of solution, right? So, you look for solutions in a much larger class. Hopefully, you can prove existence. But the right balance here is if you can prove uniqueness. Okay? Of course. And the first thing that you have to do is that if you introduce a notion like this, uh, I mean, this must be consistent. Like, if I have a solution which is C2, and is a solution in the usual sense, so if I have a C2 function that satisfies the PDE pointwise, then it should be a viscosity solution, right? And the viscosity solution, if it is C2, it must satisfy the equation in the pointwise sense. So this must be consistent with what, with what we, you expect. And this is indeed the case. So if U is a C2 function, right? If U is a C2 function, then U is infinity harmonic in U, if and only if it solves the equation in the pointwise sense, right? You take the derivatives, you, you write this combination, it's going to be C. So these two things are, are, are the same. I, I'm not, gonna, not going to prove it because I don't think I have time. I want to say something about regularity, but this is, of course, true. Okay? But we're going to have solutions of the infinity of loss equation which are not a plus C2. Okay? We have viscosity solutions that are not C2 functions. Okay? So in fact, I mean, the notion of viscosity solution includes a, a larger class of, of functions. Okay, 
it can also be shown that the function is infinity superharmonic if and only if it just compares with the constant above, and if it is it is infinity superharmonic if and only if it enjoys comparison with comes from below. So in fact, as I said earlier, these three notions are the same. So being absolutely minimizing Lipschitz is equivalent to enjoying comparison with cones, and it's the same thing as being infinity harmonic. Okay, these three things are equivalent. And finally, uh, let me say a few words about uh, about red line for the infinity of loss equation. There's not much that we know, surprisingly. And uh, in fact, uh, the only thing we can show is that uh, easily, let's say, is that solutions are Lipschitz of the infinity of loss. So let's start with the Harnack equal. So we have this. If you is continuous and satisfies this property, then it satisfies the Harnack equal. Now, you see that this property here is uh, easily satisfied by infinity harmonic functions. Why? Again, you see the right hand side here, this function of x here is a cone. So you have a constant plus another constant, which is the maximum of these things, x minus y. So this is a cone centered at y. And you see that. Uh, at the, at the boundary of this uh, of this ball, this condition is easily satisfied because at the boundary of the ball, so if x belongs to the boundary, the distance of x to y is going to be r. So this becomes r. This cancels with this. The u of y cancels with this u of y, and you just have that u of x is less or equal than the maximum per w on the boundary of the ball of u of w. So if x is on the boundary, this is of course trivial. Right, so this condition holds trivially for x on the boundary, since this is a cone. Right. Well, of course, you can say, but the cone. What's the vertex of the cone? The vertex of the cone is y, and y belongs to the to the set. So you 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 are not allowed to do that. But then I'll tell you, okay. So remove the center of the ball. Remove the y. Okay. Because you can remove it, because for x equals y, this is obviously trivial, right? Because if x equals y, then this is real, right? And you just have u of y less or equal than u of y, obviously. So you can remove the center, you have a cone with vertex, which is not in the set, right? And then since you have comparison with cones, because if the function is infinity harmonic, it enjoys comparison with cones, if this holds on the boundary, then it's going to hold in the interior. Okay. So this property is really satisfied by infinity harmonic functions. So if you have an infinity harmonic function uh, in the viscosity sense, it's going to satisfy this, and then you have a harmonic interval. Now, this is a bit weird, right? Because we have the supreme and less or equal than one third of the infinite. But this is because u is negative. Okay. So u is a negative function. So, of course, this makes sense. Okay. Uh, the proof is very simple, but maybe I'll just skip it. And from this follows that if u is infinity harmonic, then it is locally Lipschitz. And then it is differentiable almost everywhere by Radmacher's theory. And again, the proof is an application of the, of the Harnack inequality. And I think I'm also going to, to skip it. It's very simple. It's a very simple proof. Uh, so this comes almost for free. So infinity harmonic functions are differentiable almost everywhere because they are Lipschitz functions. Now, what have we done in the last 30 years? The best result to date was to improve this to differentiability everywhere. Okay. So now we know, and this is a result due to Evans and Smart, we know that infinity harmonic functions are differentiable everywhere. So this is a little jump from almost everywhere to everywhere. But we don't even know if solutions are of class C1. 
So they are differential everywhere, but we don't know if the gradient is continuous. The conjecture is that they are plus C1 alpha, but as I said, we don't even know if they are plus C1. We know more in the plane. So in the plane, we know that solutions are not only C1, but this is a result by Sabine, but we know that they are a plus C1 alpha. This is a result by Evans and Sabine. So for two dimensions, which is clearly a case that in the context of which it's learning is not really interesting, we know that solutions are a plus C1 alpha. But even in 2D, there is a conjecture that the optimal alpha is one third, that solutions should be a plus C1 one third. And also, this is an open. And why? Because this function, x to the 4 over 3 minus y to the 4 over 3, this function in the plane, u of xy equals this. This function, which is clearly a class C1 one third and not better, this function is a viscosity solution of the infinity Laplace equation. It's a very nice, nice exercise to try to prove that this solves the PD in the viscosity sense. So this sets the limits to what you can obtain. So in the plane, you cannot go beyond C1 one third, but it's still an open problem to show that every infinity harmonic function in the plane is a class C1 one third. Okay, and with this, I think I'll stop. Thank you very much. And if you have a question, I think that's not good. Very nice talk. Uh, do you have any questions here in the audience? Hey, so, uh, wait, uh, I think Emmanuel has a question. Hi, thanks for the very, very, very nice talk. Can Thank you me. all hear me well? Yes. It's very nice, very nice. I was just curious at the end of your talk, you mentioned in these counterexamples that in the plane, you cannot do better than C113 because you have an example, but you don't know if you can get there. I wonder if th there are also counterexamples in, in higher dimensions. I mean, for each dimension, do you have a, a conjecture of this threshold alpha or, or no? I mean, or, or it's just a C1 alpha for some alpha that people never. I mean, I mean, you can you can you can build from this example. You can you can construct an example in higher dimension just adding dummy variables, right? Okay. So I think you cannot go beyond C1 one third in higher dimensions. And and okay. and. and uh... But uh, but uh, I don't know of an example which is dimensional sensitive. Right, mm -hmm. uh, and that would set the limits in uh, in higher dimensions. I think the conjecture is that the regularity is C one one third also in higher dimensions. Okay, yeah, but there are many known examples to to the equation. For example, the arc tangent of x divided by y, for example, is also a infinity harmonic function in the viscosity sense, right? And then, of course, you have the family of simple functions that uh, obviously satisfy the equation but i think the conjecture even if in higher dimensions is uh, c1 one third uh, if you look, look at some applications about for example if you draw a lot more the belt uh -huh. so can you think in uh, some application you get it i mean how you start your walk so instead of trying to, to extend the least one of the of the, the boundary, so you think about, for example, the obstacle one. Okay. So is there some application, direct application of well, not something that uh, that uh, I can a clear application of this, but you can also, of course, and people have studied the obstacle problem also for, for example, the right? construct the minimizer, right? Yeah. So we put some. I think we we could um, hook up some nice application yes, yes. Yes. Yeah. And there's work on the on the obstacle problem for the infinity of blossom too. Yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. uh, and actually in, in for, for that case, at least for a zero obstacle, um, 
we've shown that solutions reach the, the, the obstacle exactly as C113 functions, which is a, well, another clear indication of the, of the optimal rate of life. <laughs> but uh, I don't have such a nice application for the case of the, of the obstacle problems and Lipschitz learning. So in fact, it's very interesting that this community in machine learning are somehow rediscovering these things that analysts know for quite a while. So for example, the McShane Whitney extensions, this is work by McShane and Whitney from the 1930s. So this is uh, quite uh, old work. And uh, of course, the equation had to wait for the invention of the viscosity solutions in the 90s to be fully understood. So Aronson did everything that could be done in the context of, uh, of C2 solutions, but then only with the advent of viscosity solutions, this was uh, uh, fully understood, in particular, the, the uniqueness proved by Bob Jensen in, I think, 93 or 94, mm -hmm. uh, was really a cornerstone in the, in the field. Uh, this has been improved recently. There, are, there is now much simpler proof, almost an algebraic proof of the, of the uniqueness result. But in terms of regularity, we're still pretty much uh, in the where we were before. I mean, of course, the work of Evans and Smart and Sabine is tremendous. But uh, I mean, the improvement improvement is not. At least in higher dimensions, it's not spectacular. So it's just from. So even if you consider if you think about what the U equals to one, for example, you still have no any further regularity for that case, right? Yeah. So we have only precisely for the homogeneous case. Mm -hmm. oh. Yeah. It's fun. <laughs> hard to think about that. So yeah, it's a hard problem. You, you probably have to want to come up with different ideas too. I thought I'd like to address the regularity question. Yeah, what, what happens if you, well, you have the one, the Lipschitz boundary extension problem, and you change a little bit in some notion like the, the function in the boundary? Uh, mm -hmm. You know how it changes the, the, the solution or uh, extension, like it changes like a, in a. So, for example, if the function stops being Lipschitz, becomes just older, for example. There's something. Oh, yeah. yeah. I, I was thinking about like uh, you have a map from the space of uh, functions to uh, in the boundary to the space for uh, the functions in, mm -hmm. in the closure. Yeah. yeah. So you want to know how is this map? Like this map is continuous mm -hmm. uh, with some norm in, in the space. Yeah. I think there's no general theory. Okay, because Pe people have tried to to study the holder extension problem. So you have a holder function on the boundary, then yes, yes, how can you how can you extend it to the interior? And uh, so the cones would be replaced by cusps yes. in that context. But uh, I don't think there are many okay. it also makes solid sense results in, in, in the way of like, uh, like in the I don't know, learning the science kind of context because it's probably you cannot get, get like a completely accurate values in the one mm -hmm. you have the approximation. So you want to know maybe if it's like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, because of course these guys work with approximations, they work with this discrete case and so on. But uh, sure. yeah, Wait, any other doubt in the in the in Zoom or okay, so let's thank you. Okay, thank you very much. much. I know. You guys can stop the recording now. Let me see. I think it's there. Let me see. Uh, it's the rest of the